So Romans chapter 8, verse 11, and then we'll jump to, no, uh, to Numbers. I kept, this morning in my mind, kept calling it November. I don't know why. Um, but Numbers chapter 14, after Romans 8, verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body. The word quicken there means to make alive or to bring alive, to raise up alive. All right, so if you plug that in, uh, then it says, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also make alive or bring alive your mortal bodies. By his spirit that dwells in you, I'll say that again, by his spirit that dwells in you. So if the same spirit that was in Jesus dwells in you, then the same spirit that got Jesus out of the grave, it's going to get you out of the grave. That's pretty good news. Let's have an altar call. Amen? That's pretty good stuff right there. Numbers chapter 14, verse 24, one verse there says, But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him. Isn't that interesting? Because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereunto he went. And his seed shall possess it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and had followed me completely, him I'm going to bring into the land that he went and spied out, and his seed, his children, will possess the land that he went and spied out. If you know anything about this, the context of this, and I won't take a very long time to do it, but the context of this is where they've gone in and spied out the land. They've come back. So it's the 10 spies. you got Joshua and Caleb. They're the only two that say we can do this thing. The other eight said, Joshua and Caleb tells them, we're well able to do this. We can take this land. We can kill these giants because there's a bunch of them there. And we can kill these giants and we can take this land. And literally, the other eight said, oh, no, we can't. We can't kill those giants. They're bigger than we are. And in fact, at some point, one of them makes the statement, we're like grasshoppers in their eye. Now, I've said this a million times while preaching, but I've still, nobody's ever answered it. I wonder how they figured that out. You think one of them stopped a giant and said, what do I look like to you? Grasshopper. Okay, gotcha. Grasshopper. I'm a grasshopper. Had nothing to do. Remember, they were spying out the land. So they didn't engage the enemy. They went in and spied out the land, snuck around and looked at the enemy, snuck back out. Nobody knew what was going on, right? So they didn't engage the enemy at all. So why would they make a statement like we are grasshoppers in their eyes? I'm guessing it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, not a reality. Amen? I want to talk to you. Just a little while from the thought, what spirit do you have? There is a spirit that inhabits this planet. There is a spirit, in fact, according to your Bible, is in every corner of the planet, in fact, in every corner of every planet, in every galaxy, in every star. The writer said, if I make my bed in hell, you're there. Are you listening? So, it's very plain. The reason God is called omnipresent, which it means that he's everywhere all the time at the same time. So there's no place anywhere. In fact, that spirit is so powerful that the lights went out here on planet earth at one time. Satan fell from heaven like lightning, according to Jesus. He hit this planet, destroyed it, and it's sometime in Genesis 1-1. Now, I'm about to really mess up your theology, <laughs> and it's all right. You just get your Bible out and study. If Even if you prove me wrong, it'll be worth it because you finally read your Bible. Right? So, so, just, so just hang with me here. Somewhere in, right in the middle of Genesis 1-1, it says that that spirit hovered over the face of the deep. And the Bible says the entire earth was dark. The Hebrew there says tohu and bohu. It was void and without form. It was a total mass of destruction, completely flooded. It was a, it was a ball of nothing but water and destruction. And that spirit that I'm talking about, 
about. The one that raised Christ from the dead hovered over the face of the deep and all of a sudden, just in a couple of words, made this statement. Let there be light in the entire planet lit up just on the word of that spirit. So there is a spirit church that is so powerful that all it has to do is say light and there is light. Oh my God, I'm about to start preaching in a minute. You've got to understand that that spirit, that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, the Bible says the minute you accepted Jesus Christ, Thank you, Holy Spirit. Now I know why the first part of the service happened the way it did because we are supposed to be carrying that same spirit. We're supposed to don't let the enemy tell you how to act. Don't let the enemy determine for you whether or not you, are you listening to me this morning? I'm telling you, if that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now dwells in you, then that same spirit will quicken your mortal body. That means one One of these days, the trumpet of God is going to sound and the dead in Christ are going to rise and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air. That spirit, that spirit, that same spirit, that spirit that was so powerful that somewhere, somehow, just instantly planted a seed in the womb of a virgin called Mary and literally birthed the Son of God, that spirit. That spirit that in, that the, Jesus said, I am the fullness of the Godhead bodily, which, which means all the spirit that created everything you know is in me, and I have all power in heaven and earth. Is that what he said? Is given unto me. So all power in heaven and earth, that spirit, it's that it's so powerful, church, that walking through a crowd with people pressing around him and pushing on him, a lady with an issue of blood just reaches up and touches the hem of his garment. And when she does, he immediately looks and said, who touched me? Because I felt a little bit of that spirit flow out of me. And that spirit healed her in an instant. That's the spirit I'm talking about. That same spirit. Now you've got that spirit and Caleb shows up with it to go spy out the land. Now hear me, this is pre-Christ incarnate. It is not pre-Christ. How do I say that again? Jesus was there from the beginning. He wasn't here from the beginning in bodily form. He was there from the beginning. How do you know? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So it was in the beginning. That is Jesus. Amen? Can you imagine what it must have been like to be Jesus being lectured by a Pharisee about the Word he wrote? No, this is what it means. I don't even know. He had to be God because if he'd have been me, I'd, I'd have slapped somebody. You are an idiot. I wrote this. You, you're so far off base, you don't know what you're talking about. Can you imagine? But that spirit now shows up, and, and this is what's interesting to me because I want you to, the point I wanted to bring is that there's a development process. Now, the Bible says You are imparted a portion of the Holy Spirit the day you receive salvation. All right? It's very plain. It says that there is a measure of faith given unto every man. How much measure of faith? Maybe not to be a faith healer, but there's enough faith given to everyone to be saved. All right? There's that measure of faith. There and say it's the same. Once you once you clean this out and receive Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit, all right? But Acts tells us, tells us that there is a separate and distinct, now listen, I, people, I don't know how, this is what we grew up on. This is bread, this is one of the few things we didn't get wrong. So I'm gonna say it again. This is one of the few things we didn't get wrong. It has never changed. There's still a separate and distinct Are you watching? Are you listening closely? A separate and distinct event, experience, whatever you want to call it, where people are filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says, with evidence of speaking in other tongues. Now, I know there's a lot of people out there now trying to teach you you don't 
you don't have to or whatever, but I'm telling you where everywhere it talks about speaking in an un, or, or being filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit that way, it either speaks of being or speaking in an unknown tongue or an unlearned tongue every time. So unless you woke up the other morning speaking Spanish and you didn't know it before. <laughs> oh, boy. This just ain't no way to say it but tell you the truth. You're either going to speak in an unknown tongue if you're filled with the baptism or what we call, what we grew up listening to and what we call today is Pentecostal speaking in tongues. Okay? Or... You're going to, there's plenty of proof that God allowed would fill people with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and let them speak languages they didn't learn, earthly languages they didn't learn. Two different Greek words. One is unlearned language. One is unknown language. Are you listening? The unknown language, the root of that means unknown to mankind. Are you listening? So no matter who tells you something different, this is the, that's the way that it works. Are you with me? That spirit, the reason the Bible says that we have that, in fact, here's a story. In, in, in the book of Acts, you know, they're walking along, they run into the apostles, and one of the apostles asked these people who just got saved, have you received the gift of the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, we, hit, we, we, we hadn't heard there be a Holy Ghost. That's King James, which we ain't heard of him. What are you talking about? We didn't know there was such a thing. And basically, the apostles, they just take care of it right there. That's not a problem. They lay hands on them, and they end up being filled with the Holy Spirit with evidence speaking in other tongues. Now, he'd already asked since you believed. So we know they were already saved. They just hadn't been filled yet. He said, well, I don't know if that's true. Go to Cornelius' house. Cornelius, there's a, thousands of people there. Peter's preaching to them, and the Bible says this, while Peter yet spake these words, those that believe begin to speak with tongues and magnify God. Are you listening? And when the whole service, and now I'm going to jack up my church Christ folk because they get mad at me when I talk about this one. Now, I had one tell me one time, that they shouldn't have put that in there. That confuses people. That's a true story. At the end, after they believe in Christ, after they start speaking in other tongues, magnifying God, Peter stands up, said, Now, can any man forbid water which have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, just as we have, that these should be baptized? So now they're baptizing them. And if you can't, how do I say this? If you can't get saved unless you're either baptized right or baptized under the right word, then that blows everything out of the water because these guys are saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. They don't know they're supposed to be baptized yet. Now listen, I've watched people twist themselves up in a pretzel trying to get rid of that scripture because it don't fit the rest of the narrative. But I'm telling you right now, if you, how do I say this? Um, water doesn't save you. Water baptism does not save you. You're not saved because somebody baptized you in water and said some words over you. The blood of Jesus Christ saves you, and the fact that you believe that message and repent, that's what saved you. It's why we as Pentecostals don't generally baptize babies. Are you listening? Why? Because babies are going to heaven anyway. Amen? Now, so, so that spirit, according to God, there's a process. We, we, know that, we know that our salvation has a process of sanctification, which means we grow in the stature of Christ. So we start off like I did way back then, and uh, what I call barely saved, but uh, just not exactly, I don't know how else to say it. I didn't look like, I certainly didn't act like I do now. Some, and Sister Karen said, well, sometimes you don't act like it now. But I, that ain't the point. <laughs> it's different now than it was all those years ago because I've been steadily getting a little better at it. Amen? Did you know 
that the Spirit of God is exactly the same way in your life? That you, that you progress in that Spirit. How do you know? Be you not drunk with wine, but be you filled with the Spirit. Filled. I don't know about you, but if I get a glass out and I tell you to fill that glass up, will you know what I'm telling you to do? If you stop halfway, is that filled? God, your Bible's really pretty plain if you just listen to it. You can be half filled. You can be a little bit filled. You can have a little bit of the Spirit of God. You're kind of muddling through life, but you don't really know what's going on. You can be filled with the Spirit of God. Are you listening? The Old Testament version is Caleb. He is a prototype, okay? He's a prototype of that progression in the Spirit, that same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Are you listening? He's the Old Testament prototype because pre-Christ incarnate, it was done differently. It's still the same God in the same Spirit. Are you listening? And most of your Old Testament most of it, almost all of it, when you have a patriarch in the Old Testament, they are showing you it is a prerequisite or a pattern, so to speak, of what is to come. In fact, the New Testament says it's exactly that, that they were four types or they were patterns of old and that we're supposed to, we're supposed to look at those patterns to figure out how we're supposed to do it now. So let's think about this for a minute. The Bible tells us just a very few things about Caleb on the spot right here when it's talking about because God says about Caleb, he had a different spirit with him. I'm going to let him go in. And I'm not just going to let him go in. I'm going to let all his kids go in. Now, I want you to think about this, and this is why it's important, because the ones that didn't believe said, our children will be made a prey. In other words, that's what that's Old, that's Old Testament. That's King James. What, he's, what they're saying is, you brought us out here, God. You said you was going to do something great. Now we got all these giants to, feed, to, to fight. We're going to go in there. They're going to kill us, come out here and kill our kids and kill our wives and kill everybody. We, we'd been better off in Egypt. Sound like any modern-day Christians you know. Sounds like most of them I know. Right? Now Watch. And so God says, because of daddy's faith, I'm going to let the kids go in too. It's good stuff. I don't have time to, that's a, that's a message in itself. I just want you to see that. So I want you to, I want you to see these two things and I'll close. I, I, I promise I'll get to the end of this <laughs> for today. Don't laugh. It could happen. You don't. What did I tell you about faith? What I, y'all supposed to have faith? Okay. We, Caleb is from the lion or from the tribe of Judah. Okay? It's very plain because his dad's from the tribe of Judah. Now, this um, How many know what Judah stands for? We've had teaching and preaching about it for years. How many knows what Judah means? Just somebody yell it out. Praise. Judah means praise. That's what it is. Why does Judah mean praise? It's funny. God named Judah the tribe of Judah uh, because they were in charge of praise. See how that works? So their job as a tribe in Israel was to glorify God. That was their job. That's what they did. It's all kinds of significance and powerful significance as you move through your Bible whenever somebody from the tribe of Judah shows up. Are you listening? So when it comes to the promises of God, and this is dealing with the promised land, God's going to invoke praise every time. Every time. It's a pattern throughout your Old Testament. Again, I told you, these are four types. These are signs of how it will be in the spirit realm. Jesus said the day is coming, what? When you will neither, you won't worship in that mountain or this mountain, but you'll worship in what? Spirit and in truth. So what's he saying? We're switching over from that system. But the prototype remains the same. It's still going to take praise to get your promise. You're still going to have to learn how to praise. You're going to have to be a part of the tribe of praise if you want to get great things in your life. 
Amen? But it's not just that. Jephunneh, the Bible says, listen, in just a few short words here, the Bible lays out this prototype. It's beautiful. It says, tells you who Caleb's daddy is, tells you who Joshua's daddy is, the son of none. Now, I won't go, I'm going to deal with Joshua today because I, I don't have time. But I will tell you, okay, our Bible says Jephunneh is Yafuna because there's no J in Hebrew. So it's actually Yafuna. But I want to read to you because I, I want to read it exactly the way I copied it and pasted it out of, of the Greek Hebrew study Bible. Yafuna. He will prepare. He will face it. Comes from the root word, clears the way. Right? He will clear away. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. Now watch this, because I want you to think about this for a minute. Caleb's granddaddy, named Caleb's dad, he will make a way. Caleb was born into the tribe that goes around saying all day long, praise God. So think about it for a minute. How do I say this without just getting nasty? You want to know what your future is going to look out like? Just look at the friends you're hanging out with. You want to know how your kid's going to turn out? Find out who they're talking to. Why? Because the influence around them is going to determine how you progress. Are you listening? Oh, boy. We got quiet because we don't like it, but I get it. I don't like it either. What are you going to do? Right? That's where most parents feel today. What am I going to do? I, sometimes I don't know exactly the answer to that. I just want to take them all, load them up, and take them to my dad. Because I know what he'd do even now. Now, the reality is, is that if you surround yourself with people of praise, you will become, you can't, you can't hide a lifestyle of exalting God. If you become, if you surround yourself with people who are praising God, you end up praising God. You end up glorifying God. If you surround yourself with people, listen, Caleb had no choice. Caleb go in the house and dad said, God's going to make a way. He'd go back outside and the whole tribe saying, praise God, glory to God, everything's great. Caleb had no choice. Caleb was surrounded by faith people. If Caleb was surrounded by drunks, Yeah, or people in addiction, or people, whatever. It doesn't matter who you surround yourself with. Whoever you do surround yourself with, you're not probably going to be. Now, I, I get it, because I've heard parents have so many times told me, well, I just pray that they can be the missionary in that mission field. Well, I seen some pictures on Facebook the other night. Didn't look like much of us like a missionary. Your little darling was right in the middle of them. Why? Because your kid ain't a missionary. They're a mission field. You can, until your mind develops somewhere in your mid-20s, and I, don't, I think that's changed now. I think, I think it's much higher than that. No offense to any of y'all. Just saying. <laughs> until then, you're very influential, or influ, you're, you can be influ, influenced whether you know it or not. And you will be influenced by the people you're hanging out with. Right? Because, <laughs> oh, I got to say this and just move on because this is going to be the last time I'm going to hack you off. Okay? I promise. If I had a dollar for every time some parent told me, well, it's that so-and-so kid that got my kid in trouble, I'd be a wealthier than I am. I'll start to say a wealthy man. I'd be wealthier than I am. It is amazing to me how many excuses we will make. Listen to me. When you get older, it's the same way. Are you hanging out with people who like to gossip? Are you on the phone gossiping? 
That doesn't build the Spirit of God in your life. Amen? In fact, the Bible warns you about the backbiter and the gossiper. Kind of mentions them in the same sentence as the murderers and the homosexuals and all that, but we'll, we'll send those guys to hell. We just want to step out. <laughs> I had it. You, cla- you should have clapped all ago. I had a chance right in there. It was right in there. I am going to move, I promise. It's 1222. I got to go. It's in Corinthians. You don't have to pull it up and don't stand up because if you do, then I'll get wound up and then we'll be here, whatever. But be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Evil, here is, and look this up and see if I'm, see if I, see if I'm telling you the truth. The word, no, that's, that's King James. Evil communications corrupt good manners. This is where we, this is where we got, right, you wasn't supposed to cuss. You, <laughs> I'm not saying you're supposed to. I'm just telling you. We read a lot of stuff that was wrong. Okay? We did. Because the word here, listen to me. Be not deceived. Evil communications, the word for evil is actually the word for your mode of thinking. Look it up and see if I'm telling you the truth. Just pull it up in the Greek. Your mode of thinking corrupts good manners. Now watch or wrong thinking, and communications, this is what got me, because when I looked it up, is actually the word for companionship. Now, I preach out King James, I still preach out King James, but you, you'll find that some of the newer translations fix these words. But we grew up, we took everything literally, and you should take the Bible literally. I'm not saying everything's a, a you know, a metaphor, but when you get the when you get the um, the words wrong, they mean something different. The Bible is warning you about people who think wrong and cause you to think wrong, and you hang out with people that are thinking wrong. That's what the Bible is warning you about. Not cause somebody smashed their hand and said, "Oh." Because so far, I've never prayed anybody through at the altar said, well, my friend said, and then now, now I said it. Because we're so religious, we just lost our mind. It's not what it means. The Bible consistently tells you that the strongholds are here. Over and over and over and over again. Tells you to crucify everything that comes in your mind that exhausts itself against the word of God. Over and over, it tells you, stop thinking that way. Stop thinking that way. The progression, church, to be filled with the spirit. Now, I'm not talking about the initial filling of the spirit, but if you want to learn how to move and operate at a high level in the spirit, you're going to have to start thinking different. And stop putting stuff in your head 